I think it's time that we get this show on the roll. So if we can close the lights out here, let's get this show started. You think, how can I make lots of money? Uh, you know, um, you know let's, let's bring the accountants in. We'll work out some business plans. I mean, it's, the wrong, it's just the wrong way around. I mean, you'll get one set of accountants will say, you know, yes, you can make lots of money. Another set of accountants with exactly the same input will say, no, you're going to lose lots of money. It's got to be, you know, from your heart, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and do something which, you know, you're passionate about, which is going to be your hobby, uh, and then it's likely to be successful. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Inventable CEO, Zach Kaplan. Here you go, sir. Thank you all. Thank you very much for coming tonight. So that quote, that was from uh, one of my heroes, Richard Branson. And he's talking about starting a business from a place of passion. He's talking about something that might become a hobby before it comes your business. So th that's going to be a theme that we talk about tonight. Today, I I'm going to introduce you a little bit to Inventables and our products. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some updates that we've had over the past year. And then we're going we're gonna to launch a new product. And Inventables, our purpose is to bring out the maker in all of us. Our mission is to build accessible communities and tools for the maker journey. The products that we make are called 3D carving machines. And we've got three of them. Carvey, Xcarve, and our software is called Easel. This is Carvey. It's a 3D carving machine that sits on a tabletop, and it's great for schools and libraries. It's great for people getting going. You plug in your laptop, click carve, you're off and running. We're seeing it be installed in maker labs like this. Here in Chicago, they're starting it first and second grade at the University of Chicago Lab School. In middle school, at the Pulaski School, there's teachers who are teaching kids how to be design thinking and how to create new products. At the high school level here in Chicago, Lane Tech has built a magnificent maker lab. And even at the college level, Northwestern now has five Carvies. But what does this look like nationally? Over the last year, we've installed over 1,200 Carvies in schools and libraries all across the country. And so for us at Inventables, a lot of this is about access. And if you look on the map, you can see the blue pins represent libraries, and the green pins represent schools that already have the machine. Red pins are schools that want the machine but haven't got one yet. Maybe it's because of funding, maybe it's because of approvals. But when we think about access, we're thinking about students and how many students can get access to these tools in an accessible way. We're excited to announce that as of 2017, 500,000 students across the country now have access to 3D carving for free. This is Xcarve. Xcarve and Carvey are very different. Xcarve is designed to work in your shop. It's open frame, it's loud, and it can do much bigger things than Carvey. We recently launched a new version of the Xcarve that added a lot of new features and functionality, one of which is dust collection. When you're running an Xcarve, it makes a huge mess, and now there's a dust control system to keep it clean. It's more powerful, it's more rigid, and that means that it's more reliable for people starting businesses. This is not just an American phenomenon. These pictures were sent to me from countries all over the world. Saudi Arabia in the top right, El Salvador in the bottom right, Canada, bottom left, and of course the United States at the top. But when we look at Xcarve, the map is much bigger than the Carvey map. There are thousands of people across almost every continent using Xcarve for fun, for hobbies, for businesses, and even for side hustles. When we look at Carvey and Xcarve and Easel together, and we look at what is going on with all of this activity, we're very excited. In 2017, collectively, everyone in this community is going to carve over one million times. <laughs> but 
This was unfathomable a few years ago. I couldn't believe it when I saw the number. But we're even more excited about the growth rate. Because not only is it one million carves this year, but year over year, carving activity with easel in our machines is growing nearly 100%. Think about that. I started thinking about what's going on. Because this year, we started getting contacted by more and more people who had purchased a Carvey or an X-Carve, and they're using easel, and they're selling products. And they're not just selling products, but many of them are making their entire living from products that they make from their machine. A few of them are here tonight, and you're going to hear a little bit about their story. But if you think about it, and you watch the news, you realize something's changing. Consumers have a lot more choice today than they had even just a few years ago, and an unbelievable amount of choice compared to what they had 50 years ago. It used to be that for consumer products, it was all about the hit, whether it was Barbie, or Tickle Me Elmo. With toys, if you look at a typical Toys R Us, 70% of their revenue comes from 12% of their products. 70% from 12% of their products. So if you think, what's going on with that other 88% of their products? Well, in the, in the mid last century, they used the same tools and technologies to bring those to the store. But over the last 20 to 30 years, the internet has put pressure on this model. It's put pressure because just because a product is on the shelf at a Toys R Us doesn't mean that you want to buy it. And you, there's other places to get toys now. You can go on Etsy. You can go on Amazon. You can go on niche websites. This product on the right is a perpetual calendar made by Sensory Play, one of the companies that you're going to hear from tonight. This type of product wouldn't find itself in a normal Toys R Us. They sell it on sites like Etsy and niche sites for Montessori education. But it's not just them. We're now seeing an explosion of these types of products in all different industries. And Toys R Us just announced their bankruptcy. So if there's new types of products being made in new volumes, then we believe in Inventables that new machines are necessary. A traditional machine that would produce high volume products could start as low as $20,000 but go up to $150,000. I've seen them for a million dollars. The X-Carve, on the other hand, starts at about $1,000 and can be configured up to about $2,000. Now, this means that new people can participate, but it also means that the cost to operate one of these machines is dramatically lower. And that's a big deal for a small business. We're also seeing new people starting to participate. If you look at these people, these are all customers of Inventables. And they're not working in factories. They're working in their houses, in their garages, maybe some studios. There's men, there's women. They're all over the world. But the common theme that all of them have is they're serving very specific niches. And they're using social media and their networks to reach customers and understand who these customers are. When I talk to them, many of them have backlogs, one, two, three, four weeks from their customer niches. And they're just trying to get enough time to make products. It's very exciting when you hear their stories. As we started learning about these customers this year, we started realizing that they're not all the same. They don't have all the same backgrounds. They don't have all the same experiences. These two guys, Tom and Dan, they're from Austin, Texas. Their factory is right behind them. It's their garage. And you can see their X-Carve on the bench. This picture was actually of Tom and Dan featured in Wired, because they make a product that holds the remote for the new Apple TV. What was interesting about this is they brought this product to market in 56 days. They watched the keynote at Apple from their living room started brainstorming and designing. 56 days later, they had a product page up, and they were taking pre-orders. They sold 1,000 of these in the first week without having any inventory. It's incredible. But Tom and Dan have an interesting background. They're savvy marketers. They understand their customers. They've done several Kickstarters. They also know how to use CAD and CAM and machine control software. They use some sophisticated tools like this, 
They export their files, they import them into Easel, and carve them on the, on the X-Card. We started meeting other customers who don't have that background. This is Chris. Chris spent most of his career in advertising. He was in an agency that made commercials. He didn't know CAD. He didn't have an experience with CAM or manufacturing or mechanical engineering. But he did have a passion. He and his son wanted to make guitars. And this whole thing started for Chris as a question. Could we make a guitar? They just thought it was fun. He and his son toiled around with the question, can we make a guitar, can we make a guitar, for a long time. He got an X-Carve, and finally, they made a guitar. Today, Chris has a business called Highline Guitars. He's left the advertising world, and he now makes and sells custom guitars as his living. He sells them on Reverb, which is also a Chicago company, which is kind of like the Etsy for musical instruments. And you can custom order a guitar from Chris, and he'll make it any way you want it. Chris makes the bodies and the necks using easel in the x -carve. Now close your eyes for a second. Think about what would happen if you lost your job. What would you do? Would you get another job? Would you start applying? Would you start your own business? Would you pursue some hobbies? OK, you can open them up. I'd like to introduce you to Debbie, because that's exactly what happened to Debbie. Debbie had been an accountant for 32 years, an accountant, and she lost her job. She didn't know what to do. She has a mortgage. She has bills. She thought about, should I go back and try to get another accounting job, or should I do something new? Debbie had been a bit of an amateur woodworker. On the weekends, she liked making stuff with her husband, Steve. And she had an idea, what if I turn this into a business instead of getting another accounting job? This is Steve and Debbie's garage. Now, a creative person or an artist might just get into it, but not Debbie. She thought about this like an accountant. If she's going to start a business, that could be risky. So she started thinking about it by the numbers. How much would it cost? Who would her customers be? How much would she need to earn? What kind of products would she have? How much would she charge? Could she even make the products that she needed to sell with the tools that she had? She started realizing that making the products by hand was not going to be fast enough, and she wasn't going to be able to have enough profit to really make a living. So she started looking into machines, like the X-Carve. But was, the X-Carve was not the only machine she looked at. She actually looked at some that were twenty, thirty, dollars even $40,000. Her and Steve drove all around the country visiting factories that make these machines to try to understand them. How much would they cost? How much would the software cost that you need to use with it? How much training did she need? Remember, Debbie was an accountant, not a manufacturer. She ended up deciding that she was going to get started with our $1,000 X-Carve. Not the big one that I showed that can make a guitar, but the, sw the small one you see right there next to Debbie on the bench. She did this because she was calculating how long it would take to pay back the machine. And obviously, it takes a lot shorter to pay back a $1,000 machine than a $20,000 machine. Debbie started making signs. In the first year that Debbie was in business, she sold 90 orders. Pretty good. Started bringing in cash. Started learning how to reach customers. Started getting repeat customers. In her second year, she sold 900 orders. And when I asked her, 900 orders, that sounds like a lot. She said, oh, those 900 orders had between three and 4,000 products that she made last year. Wow. It got to be so much that she started enlisting Steve, her husband, for help. And she bought a second machine. This year, they're already way past 4,000 products and past 900 orders. It's going to be her best year yet. Debbie was using Easel and the small X-Carve in the beginning of her business. We saw all of the activity that she had and reached out to her and asked her what was going on. And she said that she had started this business. 
So we gave her early access to the product that I'm going to introduce to you tonight. We call it Easel Pro. After one week of using Easel Pro, Debbie had made this. It was an open and close sign for one of her customers. She made it and she sold it and then posted back on our early access forum. This blew me away. It was the first time that we had given access to this to anyone in the world and Debbie had already sold something from it. A few weeks later, I flew up and met with Debbie and Steve at their house in Canada to just try to understand what were they doing? What was unique and special about them? How did this all work? And I asked them, what was it about Easel Pro that was interesting? Was it the way that the, the design looked? They said, no. It's very simple. This is an Aztec calendar that Steve and Debbie make. On the left, it's being made in Easel. And if you can see at the bottom left, it shows that it takes five hours and eight minutes to carve with a 132nd inch bit. There's an incredible amount of detail in that. On the right, Steve and Debbie used Easel Pro. And with a V-bit, in 40 minutes, she could make the same product. So Debbie sells these calendars for $36.87 on Etsy. Not bad. But I asked her, how does this change her business? And she said, well, with Easel, I can make about 10 a week and earn about $368. But with Easel Pro, I can make about $1,800. That's a big difference in one week's revenue for a one or two person company. This blew me away. For Debbie and Steve, Easel Pro was all about throughput. But it was also about fonts. Because she's a sign maker, fonts are very important. And her customers are coming to her for something custom and something unique and something special. So with Easel Pro, we've added over 200 fonts to the catalog. Easel has 15 free fonts, and Easel Pro has over 200. And we continually will be adding more. But that's not all. We're also introducing an Inventables business forum. This will be a place that business owners can come and talk shop moderated by professionally by somebody at Inventables. It'll be a place to share secrets, learn how to get more efficiency in your business, even start to understand how do you reach customers. Accessibility is extremely important to us in Inventables, and so we've decided to do a few things. First, if you ever order any of our machines, you will automatically get four days of Easel Pro included with that machine every month. In addition, you'll get unlimited design time in both Easel and Easel Pro. And if you need an extra day and you're not ready to become a member, you can buy one for $2.99. If you're advancing your business and you're ready to become a member, we're offering subscriptions for $19.99 per month or paid up front at a significant discount of $155.88 per year. What's important to us is that this will all be free for education. So whether you're a student in first grade, in middle school, in high school, in college, you'll have access to all of this absolutely free. With Easel, we think about accessibility. And so it's important to us that the free version of Easel is not left behind. So tonight, I'm going to introduce a few new things that we've just added to the free version of Easel for everyone to enjoy. So one is high definition preview. As we were building Easel Pro, we had to improve the way that the designs are rendered. We've decided to move this out to all of Easel and Easel Pro so you can show your clients how clear and obvious your, what your design will be. We've also added two-stage carving. This has been beta tested with our core users for many months. And now you can use two bits so you can carve areas that are big and then detailed. Finally, we've added multiple workspaces. So you can have multiple parts within your project all in the same file. I would like to point out a very important group of people to me 
This is our forum users. So prior to tonight's launch, we spent a couple of months working with them, listening to them, getting their feedback, changing the way that we've we put together Easel Pro. We've talked to them on the forum. We've emailed with them. We've met many of them in person. We've talked to some of them on the phone. And not all the feedback was good. Some said they love it. Some said they hate it. Some said we're crazy. Some said they love us. Yeah. It wasn't easy. But I wanted to acknowledge them and thank them because their passion and feedback propelled us to make Easel better, to make Easel Pro better, and to make Inventables better. There's a second group that I want to acknowledge, and that's all of the people at Inventables, and specifically the Easel Pro team. They have also been working extremely hard, night and day, reading all the comments on the forum, coming up with new ideas, and I'm just really proud of everything they've accomplished so far. In Inventables, we think about making as a journey. You don't start as a pro. You don't start having carved. And it's important for us to work with people at every stage. So this year, I launched a new book called Getting Started with 3D Carving. And if you're interested and you've never carved, we've got some free copies here for you tonight. It assumes someone has never carved anything at all. It brings them into the community. You can do it for free online. And here in Chicago, there's a couple places you can go to actually do your carving. If you want to see a machine, you can go to the Harold Washington Library. You can go to M-Hub, and Bill's got a few for you. You can also go to Lost Arts, and Charles has a, an X-Carve. But if you're not in Chicago, you can go on Inventables to inventables.com slash 50 states. You can zoom into your city and find out where there's a publicly accessible machine that you can get started carving. If you already have a machine, or you're about to get access to one, go on to Easel, log in, try out Easel Pro, and just get going. What I want you to do is pause for a minute and think about what Richard Branson said when I walked out here. He talked about starting a business from a place of passion. So what is it for you? Is it making guitars? Is it engraving signs? Is it making a race car? What is it? In Inventables, we built accessible tools, a very supportive community. We'd like you to join us as we change how products are being made in this next century. Thank you. Good job. Um, so also, I have to give you the thanks for the shout out to Reverb. That was our keynote. David Call was our keynote last month. He's so. awesome. He's the man. Uh, I want to open up some questions for people. We're going to have questions after every single presentation. Uh, that way, uh, you don't lose track of some of the thoughts you had and things like that. So uh, anyone have a question to open up here right off the bat? If someone doesn't raise their hand, I'm just going to call on someone. Alan, of course. Like artificial intelligence, you mean? I, I don't believe we're using any artificial intelligence. Why at not? The, at the present time. <laughs> Why not that I know of, anyway. Uh, Bill, hold on one second. He's got the mic. I'm wondering how you decide on new features. Like, why pick one feature over another? Sure. So with Easel Pro, the way we decide on new features is we think about two things. One, will this help a business owner save time? Or will it help a business owner make more money? With Easel, we're trying to make it more accessible. And so we try to think about what can get more people started carving faster. Which is the coolest part is the education component. Because like, we, we talked about this kind of an exchange before. Uh, I think what is so cool about what you're doing is that like tech, like anything else, if we don't get the community of kids involved in it really, really early, yeah. there is definitely a learning barrier. Like with, with anything else, but like, I feel like this, I mean, coding has its own barriers because yeah. you're like, that's like math nonstop and just doesn't look great. That's a machine. Yeah. I don't even know how to turn that thing on. Like I lost four fingers today, so I don't know. So, not mean, in your machine, in somebody else's. Some no, no, no but seriously, look, like, we're, we're one of the last companies to come to this space. Yeah. There's 
multiple billion dollar companies that operate in this space. There's like seven billion dollars in industrial scale machines. There's several billion dollars in uh, industrial software. This isn't a new thing. It was invented yep. in the 50s. What we're bringing to the market that's a little bit different is trying to make it as easy as possible. Well, it's a lot different. That's what makes it so different. Okay, so it's, it's we're, we're just trying to make it easy so anyone can get, get, can get carving. Easy, easy. Who else has questions? Yep. Uh, is it easy to import? Hold on. Uh, we got to get your mic going. Oh, sorry, yeah. Is it easy to import uh, different fonts? I mean, I have a, if, uh, if I have a signage job and I have to use a particular font, can I import it easily into easel? Yeah, so we, we have a couple different formats you can import. You can import uh, SVGs, so if you design in like Illustrator or CorelDRAW or anything like that, Inkscape. Uh, you can also import images, and it'll trace the vectors. Um, or if you use Easel Pro, you can use up to 200 different fonts, and we're constantly adding more. Have you guys so I could drop company logos in anywhere I want. Yeah, so you, can, you can do logos for, for the images. If you're advanced and you use some advanced CAD software or CAM software, you can also import G-code. I was going to say, is the Technori font all automatically in there? Is that yeah, I think we carved it last time. Yes. It's already in there. Who else has questions? Uh, in the back, do we have Sam? Someone in the I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you can do up front, I guess, for this one. Hi, Zach. Hi. Can you share the strategy that you applied to grow up so quickly your business, so from your business idea to what you are right now? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say it was quickly. <laughs> I, I started, Three years. <laughs> I, I started the business in 2002. Oh, got it. So from 2002 to 2009, I bootstrapped it. Um, and then in 2009, in, in, in the, the business at that time was uh, research for Fortune 500 companies on materials. At that time, there was no Kickstarter or Etsy or any of these things. There really wasn't a meaningful small business maker community that was making consumer products. Uh, so we were working with the, some of the biggest companies in the world. In 2009, I raised my first round of funding, which was $2 million from True Ventures in San Francisco. Um, and we, switched the, we started feeling that the world was changing. It wasn't that big companies were going to be the future of product development. It was all these small people contacting us. And that's where the energy, that's where the excitement, that's where the passion was. And we pitched True that we were going to take all this stuff that we were doing for product development for the big companies and make it accessible to this new group of companies. Um, our first idea was wrong, and we just kept iterating and iterating, and then we started, instead of selling research on materials and connecting people with leads, we started selling the materials, and as soon as we started selling materials, people started buying them that first week, and I was like, whoa, apparently people want to buy the materials. A few years later, in 2012, we launched the first machine, and a few years later, then we launched Easel, and today, um, the business is about 40 people, um, and this year, we're, we're going to have our, our most revenue ever. So it was by no means fast, but, and, and we're just getting started. If you look at this kind of stuff, it's just this year that we're starting to see um, a lot of this growth with the business customers. It started, it was, it was mostly hobbyists for the last few years, and then gradually over time, you're starting to see more and more businesses, more and more businesses. There's still a ton of hobbyists, um, but we see that the world is changing. This year in retail, the number of store closures is at an all-time high. It's not just Toys R Us. And there's other, uh, others have gone bankrupt. And the opportunity for these small businesses to make and sell these niche products is exploding. Like, every time I hear somebody that they're, they're doing this, they're saying, like, we're up to our gills. We, 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 we're like, we have so many orders, it's coming out. And so I think over the next decade, you're going to start to see it growing even more. Porn went off for KB toys. <laughs> yeah. The Playmobil stuff, man. I could build it on your stuff. Though. Amazon's taking over. <laughs> taking is a, maybe an understatement. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're happy to welcome the mirror. One more question. Hi, Zach. Uh, why this versus like a laser cutter or some of the other milling machines that are out there uh, that are larger scale? Yeah, so um, with laser cutters, when, when we launched, like there actually were other laser cutters that were out there um, at the two to $3,000 price point. Um, Part of the reason that I was drawn to this over a laser cutter was because of the finished good quality that you can get off of one of these machines. With the lasers, there are some materials that you can get a nice finished good, like acrylics. But with things like wood, it leaves a little bit of a burned edge. And you, know, you wouldn't go into a retail store and, and typically buy something like that. Um, also, with these, with these machines, you can do lots of different types of materials. Woods, plastics, metals, foams, corian, cork. 
and thicker things. Up to on, on our machines, you can do about 2.5 or 2.75 inches thick, and you can make bigger stuff like furniture, guitars. So what interested me and what excited me was the versatility of options that they give a, a customer for their business. We've got time for one more question. Yes, uh, thank uh, you so thank you so oh, much yeah. for um, inventing these uh, products. They are very good. Uh, my question is. Do these products do figure carving? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Figure, thicker. yeah, figure carving, thicker. yeah. Thicker carbon? Oh, do they do thicker carbon? Figure. Oh, fig figure carbon? Hey man, you're gonna Like a block of wood and you, get a, you, you carve oh, figure. a figure. Oh, out figure of carving. It. Yes. Yeah, you, you can do figure carving. Um, you, you need, so easel wouldn't do, I, I think you're imagining like a doll, is that, is that right? Like, a, like somebody's face? Yeah, so the machine is capable of doing it. You would have to import the file from a different piece of software into Easel to carve it. So we actually have uh, some customers in the UK called Candy Mechanics. And what they do is they have uh, like a vending machine where they put the X-carve inside. They have a scanner. And so you walk up to the scanner, it scans you, and then the machine will carve out your face into a piece of chocolate, <laughs> give it to you, and you, you pay them, and you can eat yourself. We're going to do one more question up okay. front here. I Hold on. We got, we got the mic. I have a lot of questions. We want to get it on audio so you're, so you're I famous. I just want to know your background. Are you an engineer? <clears throat> you're not I'm, I'm a hobbyist? Or whatever. What, what, what were your... Education and all that. I know I could Wikipedia it, but I felt okay. like it. <laughs> so I, I went to Glenbrook North High School, and uh, that's where I got into this. It was a program called SciTech that was team taught by a physics teacher and a shop teacher. And I ate it up. I did it all four years of high school. I was there at like six in the morning before school started, and I would stay after. We even like one time convinced the teacher to like come on Saturday. Um, and then because of that, I applied to do mechanical engineering in university. I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign. Um, I graduated and during senior year started a custom software company. I was like itching to like start my own company. I remember I tried to drop out of high school and I told my parents, I'm going to drop out and start my own company. And they're like, that's great. What kind of company? I was like, I'll get back to you. <laughs> they're like, you'll keep going to high school. Um, but so college, like basically I remember like senior year, I was trying, I, I had an internship uh, over this one summer at General Motors. And they made me an offer for full-time employment. And my goal senior year was to try to start my own business where I would make as much money as that job offer from GM. Um, I got about half <laughs> in my first year. But then, so that, that business got bought out, and then I started Inventables the next year. Sweet. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Thanks so much. Great job. <laughs> Um, I want to bring up uh, Ben Sachs from, from Curve Case and show off this awesome, if you haven't seen it yet, those of you out there, uh, this is the most insanely sweet iPhone cover I've ever seen. He makes wallets too, but I bought a wallet from Ridge before I knew Ben, so sorry, Ben. Uh, why don't you come on up here and uh, tell the world about Curve Case? So... I'm Ben Sachs, and I make phone cases for a living. And if I would have told my parents that when I was in architecture school, they would have thought I was crazy. Um, my, my path was not a direct one to having a business that makes phone cases. Um, I worked in the industry uh, in architecture and design and did all sorts of different things, uh, eventually circling back to teaching woodworking at Carnegie Mellon. And I remember the first day I bought my iPhone 5 that I, w I needed a case, and I couldn't find any cases, so I bought a plastic case, and I bought a rubber case. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to make a case. So I found this piece of wood that was from a mahogany windowsill, um, this piece of scrap wood, and I put it on a manual mill, and <clears throat> I just milled a piece of wood into a phone case. Well, I liked it, and my friends liked it, and their friends liked it. And so a lot of people started coming to me and saying, hey, Ben, can I get a phone case? And that turned into... Maybe I have something here. Maybe I need to go out and file an application for a utility patent and get a website and figure out some machines. So 
This is actually the first machine I ever bought. It's um, a $40 capital, inv capital investment in a belt sander that was used. Um, the funny thing about this machine is that we still use it every day. Uh, every single case gets sanded on this $40 belt sander. Um, but our company has grown a lot since then. What we do at Kerf is we take material that is reclaimed or upcycled. Uh, a lot of the wood that we get from uh, that we use on our cases comes from urban trees that are in Pittsburgh that are damaged in a storm or they're diseased and they get cut down. And instead of being turned into mulch, they get turned into phone cases and furniture and all sorts of other things. So we take the wood, we process it in our wood shop, and we turn it into products. So really what we do is we take reclaimed materials and through really good design, we make them into useful products. We do this in a space that's a converted factory. Uh, Pittsburgh, where we're based, has millions of square feet of factory. We used to be the largest uh, steel-making city in the country. Now a lot of that has turned into mixed-use spaces. We have artist uh, co-ops. We have 3,000 square feet in a building that has about uh, 20 to 30 businesses. So we have our own space. It's a modular space. Our wood shop uh, and shop has CNC, uh, eight CNC machines. We have pretty much everything on wheels, so we can reconfigure it based on a production run, so whether we're doing 1,000 wallets or 100 phone cases uh, or just one custom product for one customer. It's completely reconfigurable, uh, and it makes our small team work really efficiently. Everyone on our team does everything from sweeping the floors to sanding and finishing the cases, uh, developing our website, and talking to our customers. When I was looking for a machine to, to buy that had a little bit bigger area to cut than a case, because cases are really small, that's the nice thing about them, um, we can use a small machine, I needed a machine that was a little bit bigger. And some of those machines, like Zach said, they cost $20,000 or $100,000. I needed one that costed $1,000 or $2,000. So I bought an X-Carve. And the funny thing about the X-Carve is that when you tweak it and you kind of set it up the right way, you can get it to do things that I never thought were possible. We hold tolerances of one to two thousandths of an inch. So what you're seeing here is the cork that we line each one of our cases with on the inside edge, and we use the X-Carve to cut that cork. Um, but cork's a pretty soft material, so we decided one day to see if, if the X-Carve could cut pretty much the hardest material to work with, which is carbon fiber, which we use in some of our wallets. And it definitely did, and so to this day, we still use the X-Carve to machine the carbon fiber in our wallets. Uh, and the X-Carve with easel, it's really easy to use. And we have a lot of other software that we use, but it's still really fun to just design something, put it in, do it really quickly, and um, you have a finished product. Uh, our products are a particular niche. People who are really interested in tech products, they're interested in sustainable uh, products. And they, we reach them through social media and through word of mouth. The, the customers become ambassadors to our brand. We don't spend a lot of money on advertising, but we've been featured in the Wall Street Journal, NGQ, L Magazine, and then this year in TechCrunch. Uh, we started with phone cases. So we do a full line from the iPhone 5 all the way to now the Google Pixel 2, which uh, is an amazing phone if you haven't seen it yet. We also will be doing the iPhone 10 when, it, when we get our hands on it. Uh, we make these wallets, and we've done a whole lot of other products. The next thing we're launching is called the Kit, which is a modular magnetic organizer to keep all of your most essential items organized. You can find us online at curvecase.com, where we sell all of our products. Uh, our team works directly with our customers. So if you want to reach out to us about a specific kind of wood or a specific custom engraving, we're happy to work, out, work that out with you. And if you use the code TECHNORI, you can get 15% off your order. And I'll probably just leave that on there, so don't feel pressured to, to do it anytime soon. Um, and <laughs> thank you. That's just because that's just you, know, you know I'm going to buy like six of these. <laughs> um, so I, you can stay up here, Ben. I want to ask uh, anyone have questions on this and, and just the whole journey that he's taken to get to this point. Kind of the biggest point of doing this maker showcase, the way we did it, was to showcase some of these makers who are literally from hobbyists just getting started, just trying to figure out how to make money, to those that have built actual businesses. And so a lot of you are going to vary in your journey in the maker, in the maker movement and your life. And so we want to make available to you the ability to ask questions about how he maybe went from this level to this level to this level. What questions might you have? Right here, hold on before you speak so we can get your mic. 
Look at that runner. Woo, hustle. Hi there, this is really cool. Um, so you mentioned that your entire team basically does everything and, and runs the business from the ground up. Does that include things like you know, building the website and customer outreach, you know, what, whatever customer outreach you do, like, is that something that you had someone do outside of the team or is that, you know, all in-house? Well, uh, we started our e-commerce website on Shopify, which uh, I don't endorse them, but if anyone's thinking of going into e-commerce, I highly recommend Shopify. Um, so they sort of create a platform which makes it really easy to have um, a website that is designed well that you can modify that has a very secure cart and checkout process, um, and that has a really good back end for inventory and CRM and all the things you need to do. I actually hired my current production manager as a web, who is a web developer, um, and I wanted somebody to customize the theme for the website. And so he started in the business doing that, but now he essentially manages the full production of stuff. So being in a, in a small team, uh, and in a sort of an environment where if you're creative, if you're, uh, if you're interested in solving a different problem than you're brought on for, you have the freedom to do that. And I think that that's one of the most exciting things for me about being an employer is creating that space for people to be creative and to be able to kind of get excited about something where I feel like in a lot of jobs that you come across, you, you're sort of built into a box. Um, and I think that that is limiting people's potential. And so I never thought that my... Uh, my you know, software developer would end up figuring out how to make our products more efficient um, in the manufacturing process, but he, he actually does both now, so. Question. See a hand somewhere I'm missing. At what point did you decide to launch a new product, and then how do you sort of evaluate which product to go into? Um, I think the hard part is to curate the ideas that I have um, because I think when you have when you have so many a lot of them might not be good so the first sort of litmus test is the internal in the team is like coming up with an idea and figuring out uh, whether that that test passes but really what we try to do is go to our customers and let our customers tell us what they want so a lot of uh, a lot of that is actually just talking to them we find that surveys don't really pe people don't like filling out surveys um, but they really like giving their criticism and their feedback. So if you, can, if you can structure a survey in the form of a review, of like a product review, and really get people who are, you know, certain people really want to talk to you about stuff, and they really want to give you every little piece of feedback. And being able to mine that and figure out not just what to do better, but what to do next, that's sort of what we've uh, tried to accomplish. And, you know, the good thing, though, is if you make a product, um, what the... In our method of manufacturing and design and manufacturing where we're taking an idea and going through a final product with photography and everything's in-house, the overhead is relatively low. We're not sending out molds to Shenzhen to get uh, 100,000 parts made, and we're not inventorying a lot of stuff. And so because if we, if we fail, it's le it hurts less um, than if you did it at a big scale. And I think that some of the stuff that Zach was talking about earlier really ties into what you know, what I think small batch or boutique manufacturing is going towards where you have less overhead and you can be more nimble um, as opposed to, you know, a big product failing and that could take a whole company down. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Next up, James. He really does look like his emoji. And I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look just like your emoji. I'm, uh, I'm James. Um, my story's a little bit different. I pursued my making journey not because I had a product in mind, um, but because I'm a maker and a, uh, a maker's got to make. Um, I'm a web application developer by trade, and as a true autodidact, I've taught myself the vast majority of skills that I have today. Um, I've been making some things since I was able to hold a screwdriver and take things apart, and I'm always looking for a new thing to add to my skill set, be it a, a physical tool or a, um, a skill. My workspace, consists mainly of three different sections. I have a primary work area to accommodate um, putting things together, cleaning things up. Um, I've got a rough area um, to bring large components down to size and, and to some finish some things. And then, of course, the newest area de devoted to the X-Carve. I've always made things, but the X-Carve has really changed up my game. It's really changed things for me. I'm able to make things in a way that um, would have taken years of dedication to, to get to that point. 
Um, I've also been using it to model things with my children. Uh, it's very neat to see them puzzled about some, uh, puzzled of something like a how Nautilus gears would work and to be able to actually cut that out and put them in their hands and say, here, actually see this work and to see their, you know, their expressions and them, them light up with something that they can, you know, they can really hold. And all this is really simplified by Easel. As a software developer, I'm someone that's, and someone that's worked with schools for over 17 years, I take UI very seriously. Um, it doesn't matter how many backflips your application can do if you can't find the button to do it. I've watched a lot of uh, applications over the years that do some really cool things, get passed up by maybe some not more, some less robust applications that simply are more accessible, that are more easy to use. Spend some time with CAD CAM software and you'll have a list that fits that category pretty well. By the time you get to an application that can actually do what you want to do, you're presented with so many options, you feel like you need to go back to training before you can even start using anything. But what Inventables has done is they've really removed that barrier of entry. Not only is their machine affordable, but their software is free and it's awesome. Their online community that they've fostered is vibrant and full of knowledge. Um, and I came to realize that this machine could be a lot more than just a toy for me to play with, but really a tool for anybody with a desire to get in there and make. Um, and that's why I'd like to talk about my wife today. For years now, I've been trying to talk to her into letting me dedicate a large corner of the basement to a CNC machine that I would buy from you know, parts off eBay and construct my own. Um, I could have written some muddled Python and, and borrowed some code and gotten something that worked and made moderately assemblable parts. And, um, it, it would have done its thing. Um, but I was finding that unless I lowered my standards to just barely functional, any kind of those machines, even if I built them myself, were really beyond my budget. Um, I'd seen the X-Card featured on a few YouTube channels over the years and simply dismissed it as, as in, too expensive for a hobbyist's needs. Um, and, and then I came across their website and realized that was not the case. A few months ago, we pulled the trigger and we purchased an X-Card. At that time, my wife was a preschool teacher, um, run ragged by kids with ever-increasing difficulties and only given more and more responsibilities with her, uh, from her director and lost more and more of her prep time as, as things go on. Uh, she felt more and more that her job was pivoting from early childhood education to simply disaster prevention. My wife is uh, very creative, which leans her to be an excellent teacher of young ones. My children are a testament to that. She spent several years as a photographer, flexing her creative muscles, learning about things like lenses and bokeh, uh, framing, design, things like that. But most of her creativity in the last several years has been um, channeled towards student engagement and not really making the things that she wants to make. With a minimal background in design and, and, and the concept of vectors, Easel became her gateway. She dove in head first and started making all these things that have been rolling around in her mind. This woman that would roll her eyes at me for deep diving into all the things that I have shoved in my brains over the years, um, now spent hours reading about bits and feed rates and could talk about flute design and chip ejection with the best of them. Her YouTube suggestion turned from a hodgepodge of cat videos and preschool suggestions to full-on geek videos. Inventables had ignited her passion to make. She began applying her newfound abilities with the X-Carve and her innate creativity, and we've produced some really cool things. Stamps, coasters, bowls, signs, embossed paper, boxes, trivets, eggs holders, the list goes on. And that was the tipping point for her. She's since quit her job to find her way as a maker and spent the last week at a, um, a craft fair with other creatives trying to come up with her niche and, and find out what she wants to do. Her life is now more about creating little pieces of happy and sending them out in the world. And what is better than that than doing what you love and giving the world some much needed happy. So thanks to Inventables for turning my wife into a full on maker and for sharing this great thing with the world. It's awesome to see Easel continue to grow with its latest release and all the, the uh, wonderful things that come next. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my journey and don't forget to be awesome. Good job. Any question for James? I can't really see if you can wave your hand if you want to wave your hand. Thank you. So since uh, you and your wife are new on your journey, since you and your wife are new on your journey, um, what do you guys think is is next? Um, I don't know, uh, and I think I think that's one of the cool things about the X-Carve is that we didn't have to come up with a business plan in order to find investments in order to buy this massive machine to just start playing with it. 
um, because we approach it at a little bit more of a hobby standpoint, we're able to answer those questions as they come along. Um, we've already come up with, yeah, I don't know, 30 different things that we've made, and more than half of those, once we made a couple of them, were thrown right in the trash. Um, you know, they're just, either they didn't interest us or they just turned into, okay, we understand that this is going to be much more of, I'm going to chunk through these, than really do something that's creative and, and fulfilling to um, her and I. Any other questions? I want to ask one question of you. Uh, you talked about the fact that this was something that you kind of championed and were like trying to convince your wife, like, can we do this? Can we, can we do this? Like, and then she takes it over and is like, yeah, we're in, I'm in, and she's like all over and <laughs> she's at a conference and you're sitting here talking about it, actually talking about her. Uh, what has it been like to find something unique that you can sort of bind your family and like make a family thing of? Because I feel like we have a lot of cool stuff on the stage, lots of cool tech, but there's always this barrier where it becomes, you know, it's either his or it's hers, it's definitely not the kids, it's either for commerce, it's never for fun, and you guys have found this thing where like, not only can you use it and sort of create another bond with your wife that you probably didn't have before, and actually what probably annoyed the shit out of her is now something that annoys the shit out of you, which makes it perfect. Right. Uh, but it's something you can unify your kids with and they can get involved in creating early. What has it been like for you to like, was that something you expected or was that something that just sort of happened? Um, well, I mean, with, uh, with the career that I have and the fact that it, it does suck me in on, on several occasions, I try to bring my kids into a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's not fair for me to say, okay, well, I've got this hobby that I'm going to spend all this time on on the week. You guys go, go do your <laughs> thing, you know. Um, so that's something that we always try to do. And honestly, um, it gets a little scary when my wife and I both get into the same thing. Um, it doesn't happen often. Most of the time, we're pretty good at keeping each other in check. You know, I'll say, hey, can I go spend $10,000 on something? And she will laugh at me and, and we no. will move on. Um, <laughs> and that has, on a, on a couple occasions, we've drived on things and then we've had to, you know, roll things back. Um, but it, it's been a great experience. You know, I love uh, working in education. I love seeing that, that spark of interest and um, you know, to be able to watch somebody take something in their head and, and put it into something they can hold in their hands is, is, is really cool. Um, and to be you know, alive during this, this revolution of parts is, is pretty neat. Awesome, great job, very good. You can, you can add to the list. Zach can add to the list. Maker, creator, company owner, entrepreneur, marriage therapist. All things, all things equal. Uh, Brandon, I want to have you come to the stage to talk about Well Made. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, four years ago, I traded a six-figure salary for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, four years ago, I traded a six-figure salary for a pile of sawdust, quite literally. Back in 2013, uh, or 2013, I founded Well Made. We are a design studio focused on custom furniture and um, home products located here in Chicago. Prior to Well Made, I worked for about 10 years in the advertising industry as an art director, creating campaigns for brands like Porsche, Corona, and Panera Bread. And I began to get really frustrated at this gap between the quality of the things we think we own and the quality of the things we actually do own. It was like somebody stepped in between us and made this decision for us that it was okay for our things to just fall apart. And that just really didn't sit well with me, so I threw caution to the wind, and I started a company that I believed could make a difference. But my journey as a maker started quite a bit earlier than that. I grew up in a small town about 40 miles north of Detroit, Michigan. I come from a family of seven people. Uh, my mother stayed at home, and my dad, he's an engineer, but um, even though he was a good engineer, on a single income family with five kids, there was never a lot of extra money around. So uh, we had to improvise. Um, for instance, when I was younger, we grew up on five acres and we really wanted a go-kart but couldn't afford one. So we scavenged uh, all the local garage sales and we came up with this. This rusty <laughs> piece of shit uh, cost us 25 bucks. Uh, we took it home, power washed it. We actually cut the frame in half and welded on some suspension because we were replacing the half horse engine with a five horsepower engine. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> was this safe? Not by today's standards, but was it four feet long and went 50 miles an hour? You're damn right it did. <laughs> so Well Made operates a 3,000 square foot wood shop, um, and we have some pretty fun tools. Uh, we work primarily with solid hardwood, so we have the things you'd expect, like a table saw, a jointer, a planer, those types of things. 
But we also have some pretty industrial equipment like our spray booth, our wide belt sander, and our line bore. Um, but I have to say that my two favorite machines are our laser engraver and our X-Carve CNC from Inventables. Um, you see, woodworking is primarily about two things, uh, repeatability and accuracy. Uh, but well-made is about so much more than that. We need our tools to function more or less like a pencil. Um, for us, easel isn't just software and the X-Carve isn't just a CNC. These are extensions of our creativity that allow us to get our ideas out of our head and into the physical world as quickly as possible. And that's incredibly important because if you're going to build a company that's viable at scale, you have to be efficient with your time. And more in the context of well-made, what that means for us is that um, our labor is not only our scarcest asset, but it's our most expensive reoccurring liability. So we've done projects for brands like Radio Flyer, Electronic Arts, and Starbucks, and you can find our products on the shelves of MoMA, Smithsonian, and Guggenheim, and none of that happened by accident. So when you market a small business, it's important to understand that you operate behind what I call the veil of perception. Or in other words, people only know what you show and what you tell them. So it's really important to be crystal clear in your communications. You have to have great photos. And when it comes to new business efforts, we seek uh, companies that either have parallel interests or that have pain points that our products solve in a specific way. So what in the world does WellMade actually make? Um, before I get into that, I just kind of want to share with you that we believe that as the world continues to move faster and faster, our home is the place where we all feel okay to drop our guard. And within the home, we all have these rituals that make us us, whether it's art projects, um, cooking, entertaining, whatever it is, WellMade's well -made products will always focus on celebrating those moments with you. So for instance, our flagship product is a magnetic poster frame that simplifies the framing process by eliminating most of it. Rackless is a floating magnetic key shelf, but it's also a focal point for you to stay organized as you come and go from the big bad world. And our latest effort is visible vinyl. Um, I'm an artist and I grew up as an artist, and for me it's important that art has a place in my life. And music is not much for me without the album artwork, so I wanted to design something that showcased that. So um, you can find us online at wearewellmade.com and you can see our custom furniture and our full product line. Um, and as a special thank you uh, for attending this evening, use the coupon code Let's Be Friends for 25% off your entire order through the end of the month. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Uh, before we get into your Q&A real quicker, I have to say, I'm looking at Zach, I have to think, how amazed are you when you look at these people and what they create with this thing that you created. I mean, I, I'm sure you had all these ideas of like what you're gonna build. Like, oh, this is what I would build, whatever. Like, I don't know how you are like me. I'm a little bit, I don't wanna say I'm a little self only, but like I look at myself and like what I'm trying to build, like wow, to see the things that you've created, to see curve case, to see what we're gonna see next with Magda and Casey. How like blown away, uh, John, if you can put the mic in front of Zach, how blown away are you with just what you're seeing? Because I, I didn't create this and I'm blown away. Yeah. I mean. It's the most inspiring part of my job. The most rewarding thing is just to see all of this stuff. Like when we first started trying to market the machine, we, we would come up with ideas ourselves and like show people, and people yeah. are like always oh, like ah. And then like you see like the curve case, and you're like, oh my god, how did he do that? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just this is. I, I just wanted to get your feedback in the middle of this because awesome. it's so crazy to see this, and it's incredible. And, and Brandon, uh, I want to open this up to questions about sort of your journey and how you build this because you're. You know, I'd say similar to uh, Curve Case, pretty far along in this process. Are there any questions for, for Brandon? Somebody has to ask a question. I will point at someone random, so you better put your hand up. I'm about to do it. I know you. I, I can know you too. <laughs> Eric, you got a question? Yeah. Hold on, I'm going to take it. So we're, you know, in a similar sort of situation. One of the big challenges I, I constantly get asked is how do you scale a business like ours um, where the inherent value is, is that it's handmade, that it's well-made, and that uh, you know, the pressure is to scale is to go to like thousands of pieces or hundreds of thousands. So how, how do you scale a business like this? Um, I think that one, one big theme that's run um, with us throughout the last four years is that um, we, we try to be um, 
as humble as, a po as possible as we approach what our bottlenecks are. And sometimes that is an employee, and sometimes that's a machine, and oftentimes it's me. Um, the best managers that I've ever worked with were the ones that knew when to get out of the way. And so um, the same way that uh, the X-Carve lets me get stuff out of my head and into the physical world, if I can get out of uh, the way of some of my employees, they actually solve a lot of problems. And so it's a really humbling experience um, when you're trying to scale and you feel this pressure to solve all the problems, but you actually relinquish a little bit of control and you realize that um, your customers or your employees or your mentors or your wife will actually help you in solving the problems that you thought were problems, but to them they weren't. They were just something to, to sort out. Any other questions? All right, great job. <laughs> Casey and Magda, come on down. Hi everyone, my name is Magda and this is uh, my husband Casey and we are the owners, makers and designers at Sensory Play. Actually Sensory Play was born in 2014 when I was stay home mom, but being a mom was just not enough for me. I started to uh, portray those wooden cutouts um, and I was just spending hours like painting and finishing them and, and reselling them on some, some Facebook boards. Um, my husband actually one day surprised me. I walk into the living room and there is this huge box in the, in the middle of my living room. And that was actually my very first and my very own band saw. And I really jumped in into just cutting my stuff and doing what I want to do. So we really built our workshop. And then we got stuck. We literally got stuck because we didn't know what to do with sensory play. Do we want to bring the sensory play farther? And then we stumble across Inventables. And you know, it took us a couple months to actually thinking and decided if we really want to do it. And yes, we did. We pulled the trigger, we got ourselves an X carve, and right, just like that, our little hobby turned into a toy making business. Uh, we opened a shop um, at Amazon Handmade, we added some cool stuff on our Etsy, and we, I mean, our business just exploded. Um, we were featured at Martha Stewart, American Made. Uh, you can find our items in Art Gallery, The Rising Phoenix in Michigan City. Uh, one of my largest rainbows is actually a centerpiece at the Sierra Club at uh, Yosemite National Park. Uh, but Sensory Place, Sensory Play took us actually even farther. Um, as of December 2016, Sensory Play is sub fully supporting our family. So like Magda said, we're Sensory Play, and we're located right here in the greater Chicago area in Plainfield, but we're a global business now. We are literally shipping worldwide our toys out to kids everywhere. Uh, however, we still do it all at home. We have a workshop in our basement and a workshop in our garage <laughs> and pretty much anywhere we can find space in the house we use as a finishing <laughs> studio. So we, we do it all at home. Um, and uh, you can find the, the typical woodworking tools that you would, but we've got a couple of favorites that really kind of carry us. The band saw, the scroll saw, the lathe. Magda is an amazing, talented carver. She's got the sharpest knives in the world. I'm not allowed to touch nope. them. Um, <laughs> and of course, our X carve, which is kind of the center of our workshop. Pretty much everything either starts or gets finished on the X carve now. We, we like to put a touch of it in almost everything. Um, we really love uh, both of our X-Carves. Um, they're like employees that you don't have to pay. They never sleep. And aside from electricity, we don't feed them. So um, they're really cool. We, we love the combination with the easel as well, um, as it really just allows, you know, I get woken up a couple times a week. Magda wakes me up at 3 a.m. Casey, I've got an idea. And by noon, we have a prototype. And then by dinner time, we're able to market it to our consumers, have a finished product ready to produce. So we, we really love the combination. And especially now, uh, Zach mentioned, you know, talked about the, X, the ESO, ESO Pro, Pro. And that has just been amazing for us as well. Um, so our products really appeal to a very specific group of customers. 
Our products are made from wood, which is a safer alternative to those loud and noisy, obnoxious plastic toys. Uh, so our toys really are Montessori and Waldorf inspired. Our kids is with the, our heart is with the kids, and we always try to bring something educational to them. But trust me, we do much more than just the toys. So we started our marketing from the ground up, just like the company, and really got um, in with like Facebook buy sell trade websites. And uh, you know, we we built a little word of mouth around us. And then when we started to get bigger, we realized there was a lot more. So you know, hundreds of hours into search engine optimization, um, so that we can put our products in front of the people that didn't know that they needed our products. And uh, so we we use that on several different things. And Magda has done an amazing job of building a local clientele through different groups and organizations so that the parents in our community know that when they want to buy the coolest gift for their kid for their birthday or for Christmas or whatever, they come to us. Well, speaking about the coolest toy ever, um, the first picture showed you that our logo has a rainbow. Rainbow is actually a symbol of my first item that I've ever made and I've ever sold. Right now, I probably make around 100 rainbow, rainbows a week. Um, we have different sizes, and trust me, it's not only a fun toy for kids. You can ask Zach because he spends hours playing with his rainbow. So we make all of our products for, so that the kids can play with them and then that they can turn them over to their kids to play with them and then that they can continue to pass them on for generation to generation. Uh, they're all heirloom quality. Um, we do a lot of custom work as well and another thing we love about the X-Carve is if they can dream it, we can make it for them. So we'd love to connect with you guys some more. Um, you can check us out at sensoryplay.etsy.com. That's our main place. Uh, or follow us, whatever's coming up next, at sensoryplay.store on Instagram. We're also on Facebook and Amazon. We really appreciate giving the opportunity to talk to you all tonight. So um, we're offering a 15% off on your Etsy order um, using the promo code Technori at checkout. And uh, for those of you all that are local, we'd love to connect with you a little bit more. If you want to come out, hang out with us, touch our products, see what we make, we're going to be on Saturday, November 4th at Joliet First Assembly of God Church for a art fair on, uh, in Plainfield from 9 until 3 p.m. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Clicker. Any questions for Sensory? Yeah, absolutely. We do a significant amount of custom work. So, uh, you know, Magda mentioned that we specialize in Montessori and Waldorf style educational toys. So we get a lot of people that have these ideas that they can't bring to light. And they'll come to us and ask us, hey, this is what I want to see. So they give us the idea. We can dream it, design it, and build it for them. Right. Well, because we can have a whole nother forum with all of you people about the intellectual <laughs> property. Sure. You know, yeah, yes. absolutely, and that's something that we definitely do discuss with a customer, and our pricing will vary. If a customer wants us to make something for them that we're not allowed to make for anyone else, the price it's going to be a different price <laughs> than if that then Simple. becomes our property that we're allowed to sell to other people. Thank you. Yeah. You're always allowed to make a Technori sushi roll, just letting you know. Okay, <laughs> totally, we will totally make open. it. All right, uh, thank you. Last but not least, Nick from Code Graphics. And I want to mention before anyone tries to scoot out early, like the gentleman right there, <laughs> uh, if you want to get the, uh, the Carby, we are going to be calling the name as soon as you're done here. Uh, so hang on tight. All right, so I'm Nick with Code Graphics. And you know, it's funny how things land in your lap by accident. And that's kind of how my journey really began. So walking through a hardware store, I was looking for a tool that I probably didn't need, but I was going to buy anyways. And I saw something that was on sale called a pantograph. Now, a pantograph, you put a router on one end as a stylus on the other, and you trace an image. And whatever image you're tracing would be reduced on a cer certain percentage onto the piece of wood. Now, this worked. It didn't work great, but it still worked. But really what I was doing is I would print a picture in vinyl. I would put the vinyl on a piece of wood. I'd trace it with pencil. I'd remove the vinyl and use the pantograph more as an easier mechanism to move around the router to cut the picture out. 
Now, this took forever. It also was not the greatest quality, and me being the most worst critic of my work, I wanted to figure out a way to repeat the same picture and repeat the same quality. So that's when I started looking at different alternatives, and that's when I came with or came to the X-Carve. Now, the X-Carve helped me build a hobby. It's a paid hobby. It's a small business, and I call that code graphics, creating original designs and engravings. Now, code graphics is located about an hour away, actually about five minutes down the street from Glumbar North, which I did not know Zach went to. And in my shop, I have a joiner, a planer, a table saw, every type of saw you could possibly imagine. Um, being as young as I am, I probably have more tools than most 60-year-old men or women that's been collecting them over the last 40 years. Um, but you know, you have that one tool you need to justify that one job, and that's how I've accrued so much. Um, with the X-Carve and its easel-based program, or its web-based program, Easel, it's made my journey very easy. Now, Easel is a fast, quick, and efficient program. Uh, I had no CNC programming background whatsoever. You know, I like to paint, I like to draw, things like that, but that uses you know, a paintbrush or a pencil rather than a computer taking a raw material object and actually ending with a finished product. Um, Inventables has not only created a very easy program, but the best thing that came with it was its online forum. Now, on the forum, we're kind of a big family. If I can't figure something out, I post a question. They help me from every step to actually sometimes actually creating them um, in a 3D model that I can just load into easel and hit carve. Um, I got to thank Phil for that, because <laughs> Phil is awesome. Uh, he's helped me more than anybody. And anybody that has X carve knows exactly who I'm talking about. Um, and hopefully, maybe one day, you will too. Now, the best part of this is that I'm my own boss. Don't tell my girlfriend that, but I am. Um, I can do really anything that I want. Now, some people, they have a niche. They create you know, phone cases or toys. I like the idea that I can take a customer request and I can make anything. Whether that's you know, a cutting board out of Corian, a cigar ashtray, a bench, um, my most recent prized one is the Jumanji game board replica, which was awesome. Um, but the thing is that when you make a quality product, the marketing aspect that really helps you is referrals. You make a good product, you believe in your product, you believe in yourself, people ref will refer you and your business to other people. Uh, I don't have a website-based store, I don't have an Etsy page, I really only sell my products by word of mouth, and it has kept me busy. Um, again, not my full-time job, but I enjoy what I do, and I think most of my customers enjoy what they receive as well. Now, if you want to see what I've made, you can go on my Facebook page, you can email me, come see me after the show, come hang out with me in my garage for an hour. I'm only about 45 minutes away. I'd love to hang out with you and show, I mean, who knows? Bring an idea and let's see what we can create. I love the honesty in what you're doing, but I'm going to tell you, man, we're going to set you up with some people here to work on that SEO so we can start putting some coin in that pocket because, I mean, hey, hey, you know what? Hey, I have made some money, sweet, though. But at some point, I know you want to get off that job you've got and be your own boss all the time. And insurance is fun, but it's not the best thing. <laughs> insurance, who pays for that? Anyway. Uh, unfortunately, everybody. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> That's a whole other showcase. Uh, any questions uh, for our friend Nick here? One second. My man. All right, so I'm an inventor, and I'm just wondering what size uh, can you scale to? Like, what's the biggest thing that you can create? Well, the cutting area of the 1,000 millimeter X carve, which is the largest, is what, about 31 inches by 31? A little bit roughly, roughly about that. Um, but, you know, from the picture, if you go back a slide, um, that bench right there, well, that's an eight foot bench. So, with the design being in the center, you know, four foot and four foot, which is obviously much larger than 31 inches, you can maneuver, you can use the machine to do larger pieces. Um, it just depends on how well 
your brain can work it, how, how much you can do. So um, as far as what I was saying is it's about 31 inches by 31 and about two and a quarter tall. When should we expect our Technori bags boards? You can make some bag boards. Say it. Simple. I just submitted. Do I go to this? Just go to codegraphicsinc at gmail.com. No, you go to Facebook and then you email me. Well, I have your email already. I don't need to go. True. But you know what? You just buy a four inch hole saw. I just it. asked you. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, any other questions? I saw another hand raised somewhere here. Uh, yeah, Sam's got you. What was the learning curve like with the software? In a day. <laughs> it's quick, it's easy. Um, it's funny, when you first set up your machine, it makes you draw, and one of the pictures uh, Zach was showing was, it's like a little computer guy and it has your name on there, which I gotta say that was probably one of the best circles I cut until I started messing with all the belts. Um, and it's very easy. It's, I mean, you could literally go on it on your phone right now, and it's as, it's as hard as you make it, really, I mean, my seven-year-old son has messed with my program, and he's done pretty good. Um, it's, it's very easy. The learning curve is, is not long and not hard at all. Very cool. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, let's do these last two right here, John. Have you had any issues with copyright? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I sell it as fan art. Um, I, I have a family member uh, that does a lot of work with the Chicago Blackhawks, Cubs, and stuff, and they have warned me. Um, I would recommend nobody touch anything with Disney. Um, Disney will <laughs> sue a six-year-old child for some money. Um, so as of right now, no. Am I kind of a small guy that I'm, I'm worried, but I'm not too worried. Um, if it really gotten to the point where they send you a cease and desist, you cease and desist. You stop doing what they're telling you to stop doing because fortunately, I don't have enough money to be buying a big boy lawyer That's like a different insurance. Companies. That's a different yeah, insurance. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a gray area. Depends on how that <laughs> hawk looks. It's a very large gray area you can live in. Um, but again, if it ever came into play, I would just stop. It's not, it's not worth your livelihood to make a Blackhawks logo. So, especially if they don't win, win, you know, if they don't win the Stanley Cup, I am. Sure. I'm done. Just saying. <laughs> One last question, John. I saw you there was somebody right here. I guess my question for everyone, including Zach, uh, we talk a lot about Zoka and customized products. So, how did you decide your pricing model? Uh, the question she asked: How did you decide on the pricing model? Is that for? using uh, Easel Pro, or what is that for specifically, the, the machines? Yeah, I think for the users, more about for oh, the for products the they okay. make, and for Zaki, that why he choose those kind of a membership fee rather than the software, software fee-based model. Uh, we'll, well, start I, with, we'll start with the answer from, from well, the users on how you, char how you figure out what to charge for your product. So, uh, since so charging for the product is like literally one of my hardest things to do. Um, obviously, once you make phone cases, you kind of see the cost of material, everything like that, and you build that into it, and you kind of have a steady price, right? Um, with mine, I don't really have a niche. I don't create one product. So for me, that's one of the hardest parts, because I don't want to charge too little, because then I'm not making any money, but I don't want to charge too much where maybe they'll go elsewhere. Now, kind of to what I can imagine what he, um, Zach is doing with Easel is that Easel's free. So all the development that they put into this program that we all fortunately get to use for free, you know, that's why he's created Easel Pro, I would imagine. Um, don't let me answer it for you. Um, where, and then they're charging really not much money to use a very adaptive program that we've all been very, very, very fortunate enough to use for free for so long. So I tip my hat to you for letting us use it for See, free. But all the adventures are sitting here laughing like, <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he's all free. Uh, Not yeah. all of it, no. <laughs> no, but before we bring Zach back up on stage to answer that question directly, I want to uh, give either Ben or Brandon a chance to kind of your, your side, because you guys have kind of developed a little bit more. You can just turn your mic on. Yeah, so um, for me, it's like when it's custom stuff, uh, that is kind of a, its own animal because you need to charge what you feel you're worth or you know, how like customized something is. But in the retail side of things, which I'm gaining more and more experience every day, 
it just depends on where you're selling and what you're selling. So for instance, like if you're at retail, um, anything you purchase at retail is made for 25% uh, of the actual price or less, and that's called keystoning. And so what you do is, um, so for instance, if I sell something for $100, my wholesalers wanna buy it for $50, and the equation there is they buy larger quantities as opposed to an individual retail sale, but they need half, um, half the price off to uh, support their brick and mortar stores. Now when you start dealing with distributors, they're gonna expect another five or 10 points because uh, the equation there is they're getting 60% off the retail price, but they're buying a half pallet at a time. So um, custom work is really whatever value you feel you're providing, but in the retail sense, um, for us, we just had to get beat up quite a bit, and then we just had to kind of block out what we um, needed to do and how we needed to support the company. Um, and broadly speaking, that that's called keystoning. You want to add to that, Ben? Yeah. Um, Can I remind yeah, myself? You're good. Um, <laughs> thank, but let's so get an applause high. first. <laughs> Great job, man. So, so um, we sort of sidestepped the whole uh, retail outlet by going direct to consumer, uh, which allows us to, to essentially make the product f as good as possible, knowing our costs, and give it to the customer without a huge markup. So um, you know, we've been asked to sell our products in all sorts of different retail stores, and we, we've sort of tested the waters. But what we find is that um, going direct to consumer, which is what a lot of businesses have done, works out really well for small batch manufacturers or makers. Um, we talked. We were talking about how, how to price something. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, I have a pretty good grasp on how much a particular phone case costs. But if one of my employees maybe didn't have an extra cup of coffee or he binge watched some Netflix last night, like that might make us a little bit less efficient. And when you're working on a small scale like ours, that um, it does equate. And you can sort of track that a little bit. Um, and then to talk about sort of, I guess there was a question about the price of uh, you know, the software on, on Easel Pro. $19.99 a month for us, uh, a subscription would be like a drop in the bucket. And I know a lot of businesses, and I, I'm not a huge business, but we have tons of different subscriptions from plugins to the Shopify backend to accounting software, um, credit card fees, like all of that stuff just adds into the bottom line. And for when you compare that to what other software costs, it's negligible. And the cool thing for me is I think about it as now Inventables has a brand new revenue stream, which could be potentially really large, that would allow them to make a new machine Even that I would stuff. buy. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> so say, before, before Zach comes up here to, to tell you that exact same quote, no. Zach, why don't you come back up here? Right, uh, you. I want you to answer this question in particular. Great question, by the way. That's one of the better questions we've ever had here, where it was very, like, very comprehensive. Uh, and then we're going to give away, I think, a pretty sweet machine to somebody here. So we why don't will. we start by having you talk a little bit about the price structure. Yeah, so obviously, like, Easel is free. And we chose to make it free because we wanted to make it accessible. Because the people that were targeting to use it didn't have access, didn't have background, didn't currently use complex, expensive software. And so it needed to be free so they could try it to see if they liked it before they um, got going. With Easel Pro, kind of like Ben said, like our idea is we're trying to get people as far along as possible with Easel. And then once you have your business going, once you're making a little money, we're even giving people four days a month every month free to use Easel Pro to sort of get the flywheel going to get to the point where you're making enough money where the $19 a month or prepay, whatever, like it's, it's just not, not an issue for your business. Obviously, at the beginning, it is a lot of money. And so we hope to build as many people up as possible so they can afford it. Well said. <laughs> no, I want in tomorrow. Okay. I don't know. I'll, I'll ask the team tomorrow. <laughs> Any final questions before we give out some sweet hardware? Nothing? Anything? All right. Sweet. All right. Well, we're going to do this the most efficient way possible. Oh, yeah. Let's get an applause for everyone who was up here today. <laughs> Due to the fact that we have no data down here. <laughs> It's very limiting as to how we can operate this. So we're going to do the old-fashioned scroll on our guest list. And somebody here is going to be lucky. I would give it to Bill Finnup, but he's got like three of them already. So yeah, 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 yeah. Plus, he took off, which, you know. Yeah. No, oh, okay. oh he's here. Damn it. <laughs> he's in the back. He's already got enough. Holy cow, he's got enough of them. 
Oh my God. <laughs> but he That's shares. So you can go over to M Hub and he can give you a tour. And Absolutely. Yeah, you that. should. Do, did, did everyone get a chance to stop by their booth, by the way? Because M Hub is unreal. Like, if you haven't had a chance to stop by, it's a maker's dream. So please check out M Hub and, and Bill, who is still here. So I didn't see you. I lost <laughs> you. All right, scrolling we are. Let's go with Matthew Luzatter. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. This guy's an attorney. I don't want to give it to an attorney. No. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> we try not to give anything to lawyers, but in this particular case. I have something to do. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Congratulations. Cool. Um, yeah, in fact, I, my kids are in, in school here in Chicago, and I was looking at those pictures and like the kids and their engagement with it. Um, I want to put another green dot on, on the map that you had up earlier. I'm going to donate it to uh, the Montessori Academy of Chicago. Oh, here cool. In the, in the West, in the so, be, uh, so thank you. Awesome. Thanks very much. Awesome. awesome. Well, guys, that's our show for tonight. Thank you guys so much. Hold on. He's going to get a little picture here. We'll hide this microphone because it's good. Cool. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you guys so thank much you. for coming. Thank you.